Well, welcome to this special virtual event hosted by the Aerospace Corporation and IMAX, the makers of the new movie, Asteroid Hunters. We, we're pleased to have over 300 attendees virtually tune in to, from coast to coast, including elementary and high school students, uh, fellow colleagues, and others interested in space and planetary defense. I'm Bill Ayler, the moderator for the day, and aerospace. I'm an aerospace engineer at the Aerospace Corporation. As we all know, our planet has been hit by asteroids and comets many times since its formation, and large impacts have had huge effects, even causing extinction events. We now have something the dinosaurs didn't. We have the ability to actually find threatening objects and potentially to stop them from hitting. This is called planetary defense. Today, you'll hear about as aspects of planetary defense from the writer and producer of the film, Asteroid Hunters, who will show three clips from the film. You'll also hear from a panel of experts on key technologies for finding threats, a new app that you, you can use to test your asteroid deflection skills, and what NASA is doing to find characteristics, uh, characterize possible threats. And you'll hear, be able to send your questions to, uh, to our experts via chat. We hope you'll enjoy today's event and we'll learn lots about planetary defense. Now I'm pleased to introduce uh, Steve Isakowitz, uh, Aerospace, Aerospace's Chief Executive Officer and President. Steve is a recognized leader in the aerospace industry, having worked in government, private, space, and technology sectors. Steve has served in prominent roles at Virgin, U.S. Department of Energy, NASA, and the White House Office of Management and Budget. Most of all, Steve loves all things space. Steve, over to you. Thanks, Bill, for that great introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm excited to be joining you here. First, I want to thank uh, Leanne McGinley and her entire team here at the Aerospace Corporation for organizing today's event. And thank you to Phil Gross for joining us to share more about the exciting project he's been working on for IMAX. The Aerospace Corporation truly is thrilled to play a small part in helping it come to fruition. Uh, as Bill said up front, there's an old saying, if dinosaurs had a space program, they'd still be here. <laughs> and that is what separates us as humans from the dinosaurs. We have a space program. Today, we're here to talk about a phenomena so powerful that it can cause mass extinction and literally shape and reshape the planets in our solar system. Tonight, just look up at the night sky and stare at the scar-faced surface of the moon, its numerous crater impacts. It is a reminder of the immense energy of asteroids as they slammed into its surface. So one might think, well, it's just the poor moon that is getting bombarded, but you'd be wrong. What we see on the moon is what has happened to us here on Earth. Just ask the dinosaurs if you're gonna find one. Fortunately, we do have a space program. For example, NASA is building a spacecraft called DART, which stands for a Double Asteroid Redirection Test, which is to be launched next year. DART is designed to intentionally crash into an asteroid called Dimorphos. DART is intended to demonstrate the ability to deflect this asteroid by changing its speed by just one millimeter per second, or one five hundredth of a mile per hour. Doesn't sound like very much, but this, if this was a real emergency, it could be all the difference in deflecting an asteroid away from Earth. Since the beginning of the space program, humanity has launched about 250 probes into the solar system. In a very real way, DART will be the first that sets out not to study the solar system, but to change it. Mm -hmm. Here at Aerospace Corporation, we are dedicated to the space enterprise, doing research and development for NASA, National Security Space, and many others. At Aerospace, I am most fortunate to be working with the smartest people in the world on the toughest technical challenges. These are individuals with degrees in science, technology, engineering, and math, and they apply their deep knowledge to challenges like how do we detect asteroids heading to Earth? How might we protect ourselves? And what space vehicles are needed? I am so proud of the work of Dr. Bill Eller, Dr. Nahum Melamed, and many others at aerospace and across the entire space enterprise. who are doing research to identify and prepare for just such a threat. These individuals are true life asteroid hunters. Pretty cool. And I'm excited that this fascinating and important field of study is getting the spotlight it deserves in an IMAX format that can really capture the scale these scientists are working on. I think this film could help educate and build public awareness about the risk near Earth objects. 
Many of us who work in this industry can recall those earlier days in our lives when as children, our imaginations were captured by the wonder and awe of space. I'm particularly hopeful that this film will inspire a new generation of scientists, one that can carry the field of planetary defense and solar system exploration forward into the next era and make sure that Earth is well prepared in case we ever find an asteroid heading our way. Momentarily, Bill Groves is going to share some more about the making of the film. And we've got an exciting panel lined up for you today featuring Phil and our aerospace experts discussing planetary defense in more depth. Before we get to that, we're going to show a clip from Asteroid Hunters. Thank you for joining me today. A single strike Steve. could reshape our world. And the only thing that can stop it is science. It wasn't until a couple hundred years ago we even knew that asteroids existed. Finding asteroids before they find us is critical. We use telescopes to take pictures of the night sky. A moving point of light reveals an asteroid. This large radio dish is a powerful radar. We use it to determine their shape, orbit, and size. Preventing an asteroid strike requires engineers of every discipline and a lot of teamwork. No idea is too crazy. IMAX invites you to learn about the science, the technology, and the heroes who are Earth's secret weapons. Coming soon. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, that um, video was a perfect segue into our next speaker. Uh, next speaker is, <clears throat> is um, Phil Groves. Uh, Phil is a uh, award-winning film producer and has done a lot of work on this particular film, defense and space in general. So Phil, over to you. Uh, thank you, Bill. And uh, thanks, Steve, for that uh, great introduction to the trailer. And, uh, and I really appreciate all the teachers and the students uh, out there that are a part of this event today. It's uh, really fun to be talking to you and to have you a part of, uh, mm. of uh, sharing this experience and, and introducing you to the film, as well as to the amazing people of Aerospace Corporation. Well, then why don't I introduce the first one? Um, okay. So uh, finding a threatening asteroid is the most important step, first step towards protecting Earth. In this first clip from Asteroid Hunters, we show actual footage of a small asteroid that exploded over uh, Russia a few years ago. You'll see how we determine if an asteroid is a problem and just how big some of them are. John, roll the clip. Most asteroids will never make it to Earth. But in the winter of 2013, an asteroid emerged from the glare of the sun, making a surprise visit over the skies of Chelyabinsk, Russia. Soon after burning up in the atmosphere, the smallest hint of the asteroid's power was felt. Incredibly, everyone survived. But if a small asteroid can do this, what could a large one do? Deep in the Mojave Desert lies an outpost of NASA's Deep Space Network, a place that helps us track possible threats.
Most near-Earth asteroids that impact Earth are very small and disintegrate in our atmosphere. However, a large one could make landfall and cause damage. From Goldstone, we bounce powerful radar beams of passing asteroids. And the measurements we get help calculate if they pose a future threat to our planet. About 10% of near-Earth asteroids are classified as potentially hazardous asteroids, or PHAs. There's a small group of PHAs that may hit Earth hundreds of years from now. How big are they? It's probably easier to just show you. Okay. All right. So um, as uh, Steve mentioned earlier, we know that asteroids have hit our planet before, and they will again at some point in the future. In the next clip, we show how we might prepare for an asteroid impact by tracking it, evaluating the threat, and evacuating people from the affected area to keep everyone safe. John, the next clip, please. At some point in the future, we'll confront a threatening asteroid. Scientists need to imagine every possible scenario so they can prepare for every possible scenario. There are two probabilities they envision, either divert an asteroid in space or plan for impact. Any asteroid that hits Earth will likely land in water, far from people. Fifty thousand years ago, before anyone lived in North America, a 50-meter rock slammed into ancient Arizona, creating a mile-wide hole called Meteor Crater. The impact jolted the ground, blasted tons of earth into the air, and flattened trees for miles around. From the evidence on the ground, scientists learn how to prepare for impacts. To imagine the outcome of a future asteroid strike, we need to create one with supercomputers. If an asteroid was going to hit our planet, we'd need to predict the damage it would cause. And if we know its size and speed, our computer models can help us do just that. Scientists first determine where the asteroid will hit, using spacecraft and telescope observations to calculate its path. Natural disaster agencies would use computer simulations to develop a plan of action. The asteroid Victor A3D is six minutes from impact. The International Space Station would move to avoid the asteroid's path. <coughs> All commercial air traffic would be grounded. In the days and weeks leading up to an impact, scientists would narrow down the strike corridor to within a few hundred miles. Once the impact zone is defined, evacuations would begin.
People, livestock, even zoo animals would be moved to shelters hundreds of miles away. Data collectors would dot the landscape, ready to capture the effects of this rare event. But regardless of computer simulations, impact models, and any other way we'd imagine what an asteroid impact would look like, it would still be something never before seen in the modern world. Impact reaching power grid for offline in all sections. Tracking forecast impact within a 200 square mile section of North America. All data downloads active. Estimated time to impact 820, 19, 18, 17. Cool. So uh, in the film, uh, you'll see the asteroid impact uh, and it's based on actual science and you'll find out that truth is indeed stranger than fiction. So um, in this final clip, we show a few of the scientists who are working on ways to keep an asteroid from hitting our planet by using the technology we already have. They are discussing their ideas in El Segundo, California at the Aerospace Corporation an organization that leads the global charge in creating ideas to protect our planet from this most preventable of natural disasters. John, please roll the clip. The Aerospace Corporation imagines ways we can protect our planet. An asteroid impact is a natural disaster we can prevent, but it doesn't mean we have to destroy it nudging it faster or slower could be enough for it to miss its destiny with Earth. Designing an approach to do this requires engineers of every discipline. No idea is too crazy. We're going to be very far from control. So what we're doing is we're putting a spacecraft in the way of the asteroid. Spacecraft with a nuke on it, on an approach trajectory, and when it gets close enough, just set it off. Launching a uh, interceptor to collide with the asteroid and breaking into many, many small fragments. The gravity tractor might, might orbit near the surface. That would radiate away. That basically gives it just a little bit of thrust. At 20 years, you'd be fine. Fantastic. Many asteroid research scientists attend the Planetary Defense Conference, a gathering that meets every two years to discuss how we can better identify, track, and avert disaster. By the way, that's Daisy Ridley's uh, voice narrating the, the actor from the, all the Star Wars films. Back to you, Bill. So our first panelist is Dr. Paul Chodas. Paul is the director of the JPL Center for Near Earth Objects, uh, Near Earth Object Studies, or CNEOs. And um, uh, as you probably know, NASA leads the world in discovering asteroids that might threaten Earth. And Paul is a real leader in, in planetary defense community. So uh, Paul. I think I'll ask you a couple of, a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is, uh, please describe C, the CNEOs group that you lead at JPL. What does that group do? The, the CNEOs group at JPL does the, uh, the calculations uh, of whether an asteroid could hit the Earth, uh, whether it could come close to the Earth. And, uh, and you'll be pleased to know we can do this like years or even decades ahead. So there's time uh, we can predict ahead enough, with enough time that we might have a chance to deflect the asteroid. Um, uh, we have a website, the CNEOS website, you'll see the URL shortly, and, uh, and, that, and we provide a wealth of information about the real asteroids that are discovered every night 
Uh, we, we've reached uh, 24,000 asteroids, near-Earth asteroids so far. It's a large number. And you'll be pleased to know that none of them has any significant chance of impacting the Earth anytime soon, except for these little ones that occasionally uh, enter our atmosphere. Leah, perhaps could I, uh, could I uh, just uh, answer one question I know Bill was going to ask? He, he wanted to know that what, it, what is the difference between an asteroid and a comet? Uh, what is a near-Earth object and all that sort of thing? So an asteroid is basically a rocky body that is orbiting the sun. Most of them are in the asteroid belt, but some of them come close to the Earth, and, and those are the near-Earth objects. If they can come inside the orbit of Mars, say, then, then we would call it a near-Earth object. So asteroids are rocky, but the comets are kind of icy dust balls. Um, they, they, are, uh, they contain uh, ices, and they tend to you know, sublimate and have uh, jets and atmospheres and tails. So uh, they are a, a little bit of a different breed, but they're both um, uh, small bodies that orbit the sun. Meteors now are the pieces of rocks, little rocks and, and pebbles, usually, that enter the Earth's atmosphere, and you see them at night as a streak going through the atmosphere. So that happens every night, but those are usually just small little things. Okay, great, Paul. I appreciate you sharing with that. And next on our panel, we have Mr. Phil Groves, and we've already seen his amazing clips that are awe-inspiring. But um, Phil, would you maybe share with us, what was your primary goal in making the movie? The, uh, my, the primary goal in making the film was to show people that keeping an asteroid from hitting our planet is not science fiction, and that it's actually something we should plan for. Because it's not a question of if an asteroid will hit, but when. Thank you. Bill, is your audio back on? Just wanted to check to you and we can hand it back over to you. Yes, I actually lost awesome. total connection, so I'm glad I'm back. Thank you Thanks. for filling in there. I appreciate of that. Course. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, our next uh, our next guest is uh, Dr. Nahum Melamed. Uh, Nahum is a project leader in the Guidance and Control Subdivision at the Aerospace Corporation and is co-chair of the 2021 IAA Planetary Defense Conference that will be held in Vienna, Austria in 2021. Uh, so Nahum, um, you're a co-chair of this conference. Please tell us a little bit about the, uh, the Planetary Defense Conference. Oh, so this is an event. This is a forum where we bring uh, world leaders from uh, multiple time zones, multiple continents to discuss key issues relating to planetary defense, uh, ranging from their discovery, tracking, characterizing, and of course, the mitigation, uh, dealing with disaster response that might occur, uh, dealing with issues relating to uh, legal and political and public response. And so all of these are uh, uh, covered during the conference. And also we are uh, doing an exercise, a realistic exercise with a hypothetical object that is created by JPL, by Paul Trodas. And we are going to run it through the first five days of the conference to see what would be done in a real situation. Nice. Uh, that sounds like, it, sound like that'll be a lot of fun. Okay, and let's see. Um, and then our, our next uh, panelist is uh, Randy Bell. He's a senior project leader at the Aerospace Corporation. Randy has worked uh, to share bolide detection data. So Randy, what exactly is a bolide and what is the difference between a meteor and a bolide? Well, a bolide is just a bright energetic meteor. Um, as uh, Phil mentioned, meteors are hitting the Earth uh, all the time. Phil and Paul both mentioned me small meteors are hitting the Earth all the time. A bolide is just one that's very energetic and explodes when it hits the atmosphere. And I spent my career detecting explosions in the atmosphere. Um, we weren't looking for bolides, but we do hear a lot of them. They're noise. And, um, but one scientist's noise is another scientist's data. So a lot of us have spent uh, a lot, some effort to share detection of bolides amongst all the uh, scientists who are interested in looking at, at uh, meteors so that we can use the Earth as a detector, not just telescopes. So um, we detect bolides with uh, l looking at the optical flash, the, the bright light that they make, but they also make um, a sound a sound mm -hmm. too low for humans to hear, but still, that, that's another way to detect them. All right. Thank you. And just one quick question. Was the Chelyabinsk uh, event a bolide? Yes, the Chelyabinsk event was a bolide. 
And that was one where the sound actually traveled around the planet three times. So the, the, the same sound wave uh, went around the planet and you could hear it pass. And then hours later, the same sound passed again and again. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, our next panelist is uh, Chelsea Tangavelu. Uh, Chelsea has recently graduated from the University of Boulder, Colorado, uh, Colorado Boulder and is now working in the Astrodynamics Department at the Aerospace Corporation. And Chelsea, why did you choose a, a career in STEM? Hi, everyone. Thanks for the intro, Bill. I chose a career in STEM because I've always been interested in the fact that we can use math to solve everyday problems. And I'm really glad that I chose a career in STEM because today I get to work on really interesting problems involving the motion of satellites and sometimes problems involving planetary defense, which I find super interesting. Oh, great. Thank you very much. And, um, and our last panelist is John Neff. He's a senior project leader at the Aerospace Corporation. John has worked on development and operations uh, of several NASA space missions. And John, I know you're also interested in artificial intelligence. What is AI and how can artificial intelligence play a role in defending Earth from asteroids? Hi, Bill. Uh, yeah, artificial intelligence is basically a computer software program that can make decisions that normally humans would make. So uh, there's different ways that AI can help defend the Earth from asteroids. Um, the one project that I worked on was um, using AI to um, help find asteroids and pictures that are taken from big telescopes on the ground. So in these pictures from the telescopes, the asteroids just look like little points of light, like stars. So it can be hard even for very well-trained human observers to tell the difference. And um, the program that we developed um, using artificial intelligence helps those human observers uh, find asteroids in those pictures. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, let's, we're gonna ripple back through a couple of uh, questions. And uh, Paul, let me know if you've answered this one already, but uh, did, did, you have, did you explain the difference between a meteor and an asteroid and a comet? Yes, I did. Uh, ah. So ask okay. another. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. So NASA has a principal role in the planetary defense. Uh, can you give a quick summary of what NASA is doing? Sure. Uh, NASA funds those telescopes that are searching for asteroids. Uh, there's uh, almost half a dozen programs that NASA funds all around the world. Um, the big, there's a big one in Hawaii that's uh, the, one of the biggest telescopes. There's one in uh, Arizona also. They search the entire sky um, every few days and look for anything that's moving. So they're looking for these little dots that are moving across the, you know, the, the star background. And uh, when they find one, often we've already found, you know, it's, a, it's an asteroid we already know about, but sometimes they're brand new asteroids. And we'll get either from anywhere from, you know, half a dozen to maybe two dozen new discoveries every night of near Earth asteroids. So NASA's um, searching for the asteroids. NASA, you heard about the, uh, from Steve, you heard about the DART program, which is the double asteroid redirect uh, mm -hmm. test where they're trying to uh, test out deflection methods. And then finally, NASA is um, planning to launch an infrared telescope uh, to search for asteroids as well. So that's another way of searching for it, even a even more powerful way of searching for asteroids. Very nice, thank you. Uh, uh, Nahum, a question for you. Um, I've heard people say that, well, all we have to do is, is intercept an, as uh, an asteroid when it hits the atmosphere. Is that true? Uh, maybe not all, but uh, one day my colleague Chris Dunbar came and asked me if we can shoot out incoming rockets out of the sky, can we use the same technology to shoot out asteroids as they come in the atmosphere? We just mm -hmm. have seen an example of the Chelyabinsk case where the asteroid exploded without warning, and we heard about bolides exploding without warning. And the question would be, can we do anything about an asteroid that was not discovered early enough to deal with it in deep space. And we did a study at aerospace with aerospace experts uh, dealing with intercepting things that are entering the atmosphere. And we showed we can actually intercept and disrupt a small asteroid as it is about to enter into the atmosphere minutes before entering. 
Oh, interesting. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, so, Chelsea, I'm just wondering, from your perspective, um, uh, how knowledgeable are students these days about um, asteroids and asteroid threats? I think there is a varying degree of knowledge. A lot of people realize that it does exist, whether it's through um, whether their knowledge is through video games or movies or actually working on a planetary defense project like I did with some interns a couple summers ago. Um, I think one question that a lot of people my age have is what can we do about asteroids today and what is the further work that needs to be done um, by people our age and people older than us and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, the last question I had is for Phil, and maybe you've already answered this one, Phil, let me know. Um, but I thought you did a great job with that movie. And um, I'd like to know what, you're, what, are you, what are you most proud of about that movie? Uh, thanks for that, Bill. Um, I think the thing that uh, I and my fellow filmmakers are most proud about uh, with the film was making science exciting and fun, mm -hmm. which it really is if you, if you look at it long enough. And I think the movie did that. It did. You might want to say, but the other thing I thought was so nice about it was the fact that you were actually accurate in the physics of the movie. So in other words, a lot of movies, you know, they kind of bypass some of those types of features. And uh, but I think your movie, you've done a really nice job with that. So thank you. Thanks. I, I think I was very lucky to be surrounded by fantastic scientists in front of the camera as well as behind. OK, sounds good. OK. So I think we're gonna go now to um, just looking at the questions that might've come in. So uh, uh, Leanne, anything so far? Yeah, we have had a few questions and I really appreciate everyone um, responding in the chat window. There's great, inter inter great exchanges there. We've got a question from Nick Brown, um, Bill, and he raised that there's concerns by specifying that there is an asteroid that could hit Earth like you did with the uh, PHAs in the movie. And this could mislead if they, if they are already ruled out from impacting before the film's release. So if we could have maybe a comment about that. Okay, that's an interesting question. So the, the question is, um, if there are asteroids shown in the movie, uh, are they really threats? Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, if we if we put these these movie clips up there, um, you know, or put these um, examples up there, uh, that could be misleading. That um, maybe uh, they're already ruled out, but not going to hit us. But we well, put them out there in the movie. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Uh, Phil, do you want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, sure. The um, keep in mind when you're seeing the clips in the film that they're out of context. So when you see the whole film, it'll be very clear that. What is being portrayed in the movie is, is a hypothetical scenario. As Paul mentioned earlier, and knows better than I do, um, the asteroids that we know about, uh, there are none that are currently um, posing any sort of threat except for maybe decades, if not centuries, into the future. Um, mm -hmm. I think that answers the question. Maybe Paul can expand on that. So there, uh, the, uh, there are, on our website, the CBS website, we list all the asteroids that have any even small chance of impacting the Earth. And there are none that have any significant chance of impacting the Earth. So um, what we're talking about in the movie is the undiscovered asteroids. What, what, are, what if there are some out there that we haven't found yet? You know, will we be able to discover them? And, and hopefully we'll discover them with maybe 10 years of warning. And then what would we do to deflect it? That's the sort of thing we're talking about in the movie. And there are plenty, there are like tens of thousands of asteroids that are out there uh, that we haven't found yet. And we're kind of waiting for them to get close enough so that we can, they're bright enough so that we can detect them. And then right. we'll do the predictions. Very good. Okay, okay Bill, we got a lot more here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so try and get uh, get them into. I'm going to save the questions about where the movie is going to be playing and things like that. We'll get to that at the end so yeah. that people know. But um, John asked, there's numerous close flybys where only discovered after they flew past the Earth. That's kind of too late. Um, why is that? Is it just a lack of sensors and telescopes or, or, or what can you explain? So Paul, that's probably another one for you. 
That is one for me. Yes. So many <laughs> asteroids come from the direction of the sun. So they're on the sunward side of the Earth, and we cannot look with telescopes on the sunward side. The Chelyabinsk asteroid, which was about 20 meters in size, it came from the sunward side. So we did not see that one because our telescopes can't look in that direction. The idea for the larger asteroids is that we see them years before when they're in the nighttime sky and, and, uh, and, and we have a chance of discovering them. Um, okay, very, very question. Yes. Uh, very nice. I saw one question come through, uh, and this would be for Phil. Phil, how long did it take to make your movie? Well, uh, documentaries, by their very nature, take a much longer time than um, a typical Hollywood film. Uh, so we began production about uh, three and a half years ago, or pre-production, I should say. So it mm -hmm. took about three and a half years to be uh, done with this film. A big challenge in the movie was the visual effects. Since we can't send cameras out to the asteroid belt, to film real asteroids, we had to use data and research to create the asteroids for the film, as well as the impact that you see in the movie. So th that takes a lot of time. And um, uh, so, yeah, so it, it took about three and a half years to make. Amazing. Bill, there's a lot of questions related to size, yeah, such as, um, you know, how big do they get? How many hit the Earth each year? Um, you know, what what kind of, you know, do you think it could in destroy the entire world? Um, yeah. <laughs> those, those types of things. Um, right, I've got a good question for Paul on that then. So, Paul, I think one of the questions related to what you're talking about was uh, what is what is the percentage of large asteroids that we know about right now the ones that I actually call planet killers sure the uh, asteroids come in all sizes up to maybe 10 kilometers in size six miles in size but we've tracked these big ones and we've discovered uh, 95 98 percent of them uh, and we've been tracking them for decades literally so we know their paths and we know the big ones can't hit us uh, so when you go down a step to the medium-sized ones, there are some we still haven't found, we think. And when you go down to the, you know, the really small ones uh, that are tens of meters in size, um, there's lots of them that we haven't um, discovered yet. So those ones uh, are numerous. So fortunately, there are not very many big ones and just a few, but not very, not very many medium-sized ones. And therefore, the, the chances that uh, any one of these will hit our planet in our lifetime are small. But it's still a prudent thing to do is to still look for these these ones that we haven't found yet. Great, thank you. Bill, have, have it, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to just ask. Um, there were some questions about, um, you know, what brought. Lael was asking what brought this to your attention. Um, you know, asteroids. Now, what what brought, prompted um, the interest in that? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I'm aware of is that um, Congress got interested in it some years ago and uh, basically funded NASA to go off and look for these things. And that was really something that has really moved us forward. And uh, NASA has done a great job of finding a lot of the big ones. I think the point at the time was that look, look for the really big ones, the one or ones that re really could damage our planet first. And they've done that. And uh, you know, our sensor capabilities are getting so much better now that we can look for the smaller ones too. And as Paul said, that's, that's a real challenge. And looking at some of these other types of sensors and things will really help us find some of those. And Bill, I know this one came up too in the movie that uh, where you were commenting on. Would we? This is from Fern, um, Fern, Ferdinand. Um, would we ever think of launching a nuclear weapon to divert an asteroid? Well, that's a good question, and you know, it's one, something that we really explore in these planetary defense conferences. Is is what do people think about using a nuclear explosive? It turns out that if you really want to deliver some energy to an asteroid, the best way to do it is to use a nuclear explosive. And for some sizes of asteroids, that's about all you can do to keep them from hitting us. So, but there are other techniques you can use, something like a kinetic impactor, which is like running it or like hitting hitting a, an asteroid with a you know something smaller that's moving very fast. And we've actually hit uh, some things in the past. And as was mentioned, there's a NASA experiment coming up to test some of those techniques. So um, that'll, that'll be fun. And there's some really good questions from one of our, our, our schools in the greater Los Angeles area. Um, it's a STEM magnet school gala. Mr. Um, Mulka is sharing this with his classroom and he's asking, what's your favorite part of your job? So somebody maybe take that one. So I guess Randy, why don't you take that one? What's the best? What's the favorite part of your job? Well, um, 
I've been lucky that I've been able to work with scientists from around the world. Um, there are scientists in every country that are uh, studying asteroids and looking up at the night sky. Um, and a lot of the data from these uh, asteroid detection systems, both the telescopes and the systems that uh, detect bolides uh, entering the atmosphere are broadly shared around the world, and it forms a community of scientists uh, in every country. Um, uh, some people just have simple, what we call all sky cameras, a, a camera that looks up at the night sky from the ground and sees the streaks of light going by. Mm -hmm. And they get to add to the data that all scientists are sharing for their particular reason, region. Um, so I, I would say the, the chance to work with people from around the world. Very nice. And I think that that's one thing I particularly like myself about this topic is that if you're actually going to deflect an asteroid, it's going to take a lot of work from people who are in the space business all over the world. So uh, I think it's it really kind of unites the planet uh, in, a, in a single effort, which I think would be a good thing. Thank you very much for that. Uh, any more? Yeah. And recognize this is this is a global <laughs> issue. When, if one of these things ever hits, it's the, a problem for the whole world, not just one country. That's exactly right. So, no, Bill, yeah. this, this prompts us over to the other question I've got. One that's from, um, that's coming to us uh, about, you know, some basic questions. How are asteroids created? And, um, you know, how do the, how are they formed? And um, how many have crashed into our world? And could it destroy Earth? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, Paul, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, uh, that's a lot of questions. Asteroids um, are kind of leftover debris from the formation of the planets. So the solar system, solar nebula initially was a lot of dust and the dust congealed to some, some big planets and some leftover dust created asteroids. Now the asteroids collide with each other. So a lot of the asteroids are just like the, the fragments of earlier larger asteroids. So it's kind of a cascading effect. Um, and, uh, and comets are the, are the things that form farther out in the cold areas where the ices are still there. Regarding yeah. how many um, asteroids have hit the Earth, if you look at the moon and you see how it's essentially covered with craters, that's what the Earth would look like if we didn't have weathering. Okay, so over the eons, uh, the Earth has attracted uh, a lot of this bombardment of asteroids. Now, fortunately, it's slowed down a lot. So mm -hmm. big asteroids don't impact the Earth very often at all. We're talking about hundreds or even thousands of years between any really significant impacts. That okay. impact, by the way, that happens about once every 80 years. And the smaller ones are, are more, like, more likely than the, than the uh, Chelly bit size. That's great. I think we're running short of time, so I think we're going to have to move on. Um, we do have a couple more items to share. Um, we have, oh, did you want to show the next charts? There we go. So first we have IMAX raffle winners since we've selected 10 winners of, from, from our attendee list and uh, they contain what you see there, a shirt, a, uh, let's see, you get a shirt, uh, wooden blocks, mini telescope, a water bottle and a t-shirt from the movie. That is fine stuff. And we thank IMAX for providing those things. Uh, the second thing we have, uh, next chart. So we want to make sure you watch these IMAX movies when they come out. Here's a list of where they are. And um, they're not in California yet, I'm sorry to say, because a lot of things are closed out here still. But that's coming, so look for it. It's going to be a great movie, and I think the clips will really really be uh, uh, something to incentive, to incentive to go. And you can get more information on that at asteroidhunters.imax.com. That's asteroidhunters.imax.com. It's the bottom there. And aerospace wants to inspire and develop today's diverse young minds for to into tomorrow's engineers and scientists who will shape our country's future in space. Towards that end, we are posting additional resources where teachers and students can learn more about planetary defense and the work Astro Aerospace does. So please visit the Aerospace Corporation's website at aerospace.org slash asteroids to learn more about the resources that are available. And finally, I just want to thank uh, Leanne McGinley and her team at Aerospace for doing such a fine job of putting this event together. And I also wanna thank uh, all of you who have joined us today. And I really encourage you to go out and look for that IMAX movie and become asteroid hunters. So thank you very much. <laughs>